Thanks. Well, why don't we go ahead and begin? Um, welcome everyone to our talk tonight about California wildflowers bloom and bust cycles with Maria Jesus, one of the graduate students here at California Botanic Garden. My name is Kristen Barker. I'm the community education coordinator here at the garden. And tonight I'm just gonna kind of go over the format of the talk and then I'll hand you over to Maria. Um, so many of you probably already know this, but just in case those of you are new to Zoom, um, I encourage you all to use the Q&A if you have any questions. Uh, we'll be able to kind of address a few of those throughout the, the talk and Maria's presentation, but we have time set aside at the end to go over those a little bit more thoroughly. Um, I also encourage everyone to use the chat. We've kind of got it started with where we've been able to see wildflowers this season. Um, and I encourage you all to select to, uh, in your chat, change it to all panelists and attendees if you would like to connect with each other and other people attending the talk tonight. Um, and then lastly, we are recording this. So if you have to step away for a minute, um, you can, you'll be able to find the recording on the digital content page of the website, of our website, calbg.org. And I should have that up, um, up there by the end of the day tomorrow. So you'll be able to find that there. Um, and so that's kind of it for me. So I'd like to hand you over to Maria Jesus. As I mentioned, she's one of the graduate students here at CalBG, um, soon to graduate with her, her master's. Um, so I'm sure she's excited about that. Uh, you may remember Maria from last fall, if you were able to join us for our conservation talks and lecture series, um, she spoke about her study site uh, at the conglomerate Mesa. And you may also recognize her from some of our Wildflower of the Week videos, um, which we've been doing this month for our Wildflower Month activities. Um, so with that, I'm gonna hand you over to Maria. Maria, thank you for leading us through this conversation today. Thanks so much, Kristen. Um, hi, everybody out there. It's great to see where you all have been seeing flowers this year, given the more challenging conditions we have. Um, you know, like, like a lot of us are, I also was very interested in what's driving these wildflower cycles here in California. And so I'm really excited to be here today to share with you a little bit of what I've learned um, on this fascinating topic. Um, you know, it's been a lot of fun researching all the elements that conspire together to bring to life California's spectacular super blooms. And really, I could go on and on about uh, what I've learned for days and days and days, but since we only have um, a short amount of time, um, I'm just going to stick it to, to four main topics. And my slide's taking a second to advance, so we'll just hold on a minute here. I bet what's going to happen is in a minute, it's going to advance through a bunch of them all at once. There we go. All right. <laughs> um, so the first thing that I'll talk about today is what it exactly is the super bloom and what do you need in order to have them. Um, next, we'll go on a tour of some beloved super bloom hotspots. And then we'll talk about drought years like the one we're experiencing right now and what that means for wildflowers and also perhaps their human admirers. Um, and then finally, we'll cover some pertinent threats to wildflowers like climate change and what can be done and what's already being done to help. All right, so on to our first topic. What exactly is a super bloom? Um, is it a real scientific phenomenon? Is there a definition for a super bloom? No, I, uh, it's sort of like, it's even less defined than like super moon. You might remember super moon started being a really big thing and I, Kind of feel the same way about super bloom. I read many different articles and didn't find a clear definition anywhere. Um, on the one hand, on one end of the spectrum, um, folks have written it's just an above average bloom. That's all you need. And then on the other end of the spectrum, much more specific, um, uh, the phrase super bloom specifically refers to a phenomenon in the desert, places that are typically more rocky, um, usually not laden with beautiful flowers. Um, usually flowers are going to be in shrub form. And so for these, this definition, a super bloom is really a, a once in a, a, you know, decade or so, so to speak, uh, you know, nothing that specific, but it's a much more rare phenomenon. 
And so for the purposes of this first section of the presentation, I'm going to focus more on that specific definition of desert super blooms. Um, although I think once you learn the factors that lead to those super blooms, um, you'll be able to apply that to many more situations. All right, so let's talk about the three big factors that lead to these sorts of super blooms. Um, the big one is seeds. And so I'm going to spend spend a while talking about seeds just so we have the basics down. And I'm seeing that my video is frozen, but I think we're back. Um, so think about a baby seedling and how vulnerable they are. You know, here's something, um, it's a it's an annual lupin and it's just emerged, it has its two little cotyledons, its first leaves, and underneath those is a little tiny rootlet. Um, so this thing is quite, quite delicate. Uh, you know, if it weren't to get water, it wouldn't be long before it would desiccate and, and die. Um, so it's really important for seeds to sprout and there's a good chance they'll be able to get the resources that they need to survive. Um, this is especially true for annual plants, like the type you find in desert super blooms, um, because they don't have a lot of the adaptive traits that something like a cactus might um, have to weather the dry times. You know, a cactus, it's succulent, it has a waxy um, epidermis, so it can hold in its water. The cactus can survive, but a little seedling like this isn't going to last very long in the heat. Um, so many seeds have what are called dormancy mechanisms, and you can think of these as sort of mechanisms as sort of a lock. Um, um, basically, until certain environmental conditions are met, basically the right key, uh, the seed can't germinate. So just to solidify that in your mind, if the seed, seed is dormant, even if the perfect conditions come along um, for, for it to grow, if it's still dormant, it won't be able to do its thing. Um, so some examples of the types of keys that can break dormancy are uh, the rinsing of a seed coat. So this is really common in desert super blooms where early fall rains, maybe September, October, um, just soak the seed coat, remove it, get it ready to germinate. Um, something else you might not be aware of is physical abrasion. So scarification actually physically um, um, roughing up the outside of the seed coat can, can break dormancy. And um, in, in some cases, it's actually animals' digestive systems that do that. So animals will eat the seeds and actually uh, disperse it quite far from the parent plant. And the seed's able to survive the digestive tract and um, can germinate and grow. And additionally, freezing temps or gradual, gradual warming, these can be seasonal indicators to the seed to let it know it's the right time of the year to do its thing. And then also in areas that are fire adapted, smoke and heat um, can also break dormancy. Um, for instance, pictured here is the stinging lupin, which is a fire follower. Um, so a plant like that is definitely going to, in many cases, respond to smoke and heat. So how might dormancy strategies impact species survival? So you could think about a seed that has no dormancy. Um, it can sprout just about anywhere, no matter what the conditions are. And a seed like that's going to have, um, or a species that has seeds like that will have an opportunity to, to sprout in many different environments, even if a lot of them aren't successful. Um, but then other seeds that wait for certain conditions, they'll probably have a much higher probability of survival. Um, and so in reality, many species sort of hedge their bets and do a little bit of both. Uh, typically, dormancy varies within species. It can vary within populations. And there's even cases of dormancy varying within individuals. So um, this was a study from Baskin and Baskin in 2004. And they found that seeds that overwintered on the parent plant so the seeds stuck on all winter, they had a different dormancy mechanism than seeds that fell off and dropped and uh, were, were warmed over time. So seeds that are dormant, seeds that are locked, they persist in the soil. Um, and there's quite a wide range in variability. And as you might expect, especially in places like desert where the environment is also quite variable, Seeds can last for a very long time. You know, there's cases of seeds 
lasting well over 100 years, if not more. Eventually, those seeds do expire. They have a shelf life, and they never get the chance to grow. Um, so that's one way that seeds can actually get lost from the seed bank. Um, so there's always being seeds put in the seed bank and seeds being taken out. So another way that seeds might get lost is if they aren't adapted to the digestive systems of animals, there's actually quite a lot of animals out there that rely on these seeds in order to survive because of their high nutrition content. You know, on everything I just shared with you about seeds, it's really only scratching the surface of the seed bank dynamics. Uh, this could be a whole talk just unto itself. Um, but if there's one thing you should remember, it's that you know, whatever we see bloom above ground, whether it's a super bloom or a rest year like this year, it's only a, an expressing a small amount of what's underneath the soil as a seed. You know, the blooms are really just the tip of the iceberg. All right, so that seeds on to the next big super bloom factor, and that's precipitation. You know, I think this picture really says it all. You might have seen it circulating. Um, this is from the Antelope Valley Poppy Reserve Facebook account, and they're comparing last year, 2020, which was sort of an average year. It wasn't necessarily a super bloom year with this year. We're in a drought year, and there are very few poppies in the poppy preserve coming up. And so, um, you know, precipitation has a huge impact on whether or not we see blooms in, in our more arid environments. Um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, precipitation can break dormancy, so it prepares the seeds to germinate. And then once the seeds do germinate, precipitation is, in, is needed in order to prolong the seedlings and also the blooms. You know, um, my, I have a friend up in Oregon who said that a lot of the plants the perennials that have grown have already desiccated because they haven't gotten the, the uh, rain that they need and the temps have been high. So that was a, a factor in 2021 that allowed us, or sorry, 2019, <laughs> 2019 that allowed us to enjoy super blooms for a long time was the mild temperatures and the, the constant watering. Now, one other element with precipitation is it really has an impact on the composition of what arises. You know, so it's not just the amount of rain, it's actually when the rain falls. Um, you know, every year, if you were to watch the same spot, let's say you got the same amount of rain, but it was distributed differently over time, likely you would see a different, um, uh, you know, composition or a different palette of species emerging. This is something I saw in, in my study site uh, in the Southern Inyo Mountains. 2019 was a huge rain year, and I saw old source of species last year. Um, there, there were some that came out in quite abundance and others that didn't even show up at all. You know, so when precipitation comes, you know, it might not be everything that blooms, but something will. And unfortunately, that means that uh, in some years, it's just invasive species that we see, uh, particularly the opportunistic species. Now, so next we'll talk about the role of invasive plants and how this figures into whether we have super blooms or not. And I really learned the most about this topic from this book by Richard Minnick. California's Fading Wildflowers Lost Legacy and Biological Invasions. I really recommend you check it out if you're interested in these cycles. Um, but in his book, he details how wildflower displays in California used to be much more frequent and widespread. And a huge driver of their decline, as you might imagine, has been habitat loss due to urbanization, agriculture, grazing. Um, but a more hidden driver of this loss, uh, you know, superficially, uh, is invasive species. You know, I think of the park near where I live and from afar, you know, it's a nice open space. Um, but when you look closer, uh, the blooms are, are all of one type and they're, they're typically uh, annual mustards. So, you know, invasive species are quite opportunistic and they displace na native species. Um, they often can emerge before the natives come up and a lot of times they, they might not need as much precipitation or they might not have the same dormancy pattern. So uh, it just takes a little bit of rain for them to keep replenishing the seed bank. So, you know, in order for a super bloom to occur, uh, there really needs to be either an absence of invasives or some other way of controlling them. 
So in some places, Minnick and others have observed that after several years of drought, certain invasive species actually become depleted um, after a few years. And that basically clears the way for super blooms to happen in a good rain year. So, um, you know, you think about that next time you check out a super bloom and you're in a, a maybe a, a more average year, uh, check to see what the composition of, is of, of invasive plants that's coming up. And I just thought this was a cool photo from the 19, this is from 1900 in, in Pasadena um, showing folks, it's hard to tell because it's black and white, but they're collecting uh, poppies. And, you know, Minnick writes, just to drive the point home, that um, basically up until the 40s, wildflower displays were a lot more consistent um, uh, west of the deserts where there is more precipitation. But by the 1960s, even in wet years, a lot of the displays have been drastically reduced because of invasives. Fortunately, we do have some remnant locations of this grain year. Uh, and, oh, I forgot about this slide. This is actually my study site. And this is an example of what it looked like last year. Uh, lots of brome. And the year before, there were a lot of wildflowers. So this is the place I'm curious to keep watching to see, to see what happens. All right. So for this next section, uh, we'll be going on a tour of some beloved super bloom hotspots. So if you haven't gotten to see any grand wildflower shows, uh, We'll, we'll get to go on a little virtual tour here. But first, I have to give you all a lesson in etiquette in case you weren't aware, although I'm sure many of you are, um, but maybe you can take a picture of this slide or something and share it with your friends. But really people, especially in California, have been trampling the wildflowers for over a hundred years. <laughs> Um, this booklet is actually from the 1930s, and this was distributed at gas, gas stations here in Southern California. And in it, they're, they're telling their readers, remember this, in California, it is an illegal act, punishable by fine, to pick, destroy, or have in your possession any wildflowers, fern, shrubs, or cacti. Um, and Unfortunately, people still haven't got a lesson. They're still trampling the wildflowers. Um, this is a picture from 2019 that was featured on the Modern Hiker website. And they, they, put a, they included a really good post here just detailing the impacts of not only um, being at the site and harming wildflowers, but also um, how wildflowers you can perpetuate or not um, with social media. So, you know, just to be clear uh, what the proper wildflower etiquette is, is stay, stick to established trails, you know, leave flowers and habitat in the same condition you found them. And, you know, use discretion in sharing your locations. Just remember that if you put it on social media, there's no telling how it's gonna take off. And there is potentially thousands of people could, could flock to the place you just promoted. And, you know, also share your care in your posts. So next time there's a super bloom year, consider using this hashtag and consider uh, encouraging others to be responsible with their wildflower viewing. All right, so if everyone has that, we will continue on our adventure. Um, so we're gonna be going all over mostly Southern California. We'll be starting in Anza Borrego. We'll uh, jog north to Death Valley National Park. Then we'll hit um, Antelope Valley to the Poppy Preserve, Carrizo Plain, one of my favorites, and then uh, Table Mountain, which I think someone in our audience has been here this year. All right. So on to Borrego State Park, uh, I have been wanting to go here for years and I still haven't gotten the chance. So hopefully some, some year soon will be the time to go. Um, this is a unique, location in Southern California because it um, this is more of a Sonoran desert environment. And what makes that special is it this area still gets summer rain um, in addition to the winter rain. And because of that extra moisture at that time of year, uh, it, it supports a much different um, uh, composition of plants. So there's many species of agave, yucca, nalina, 
Um, there's Ocotillo, Desert Willow. Uh, many of these you can actually see here at California Botanic Garden because we provide them with artificial sources of water. <laughs> but uh, here at Anza Borrego, they grow naturally. You know, they also, there's places, um, Tom Chester, uh, who is a researcher, uh, post-retirement researcher, has been documenting um, just how Sahara mustard has really taken over. It's an, an invasive plant, has taken over some parts of Anza Borrego um, since 2000. And there's some places that are nearly 100% um, mustard cover. Um, so that's an instance of where these super blooms have been displaced by, by invasives. But something that you might encounter here on the Borrego is the desert lily. Um, I think this is an absolutely beautiful plant. Uh, this is something you'll find in low elevation areas in the Sonoran Desert and a little bit into the Mojave as well. And this is a perennial plant that grows from a bulb underground and usually it'll start flowering as early as February. Something more rare you might encounter on Zebrago is Orchids aster, Xyloriza orchidei, which superficially looks very similar to um, a more common plant you'll see in the Mojave, uh, but this one is special. It's, uh, you can tell it apart by the leaves, so the leaves have these um, protrusions at the margins. Um, but this this plant, you'll really mostly just see it in Anza Borrego and perhaps near the Salton Sea, and it does get down a little bit into Baja. And just a couple more super bloom shots from Anza Borrego. There's still some blooms happening there. You just have to go to the right spot this year. All right, so on to our next stop. So now we're going to Death Valley. We're jutting way north. So we're totally outside of the Sonoran Desert now. No more summer rains for us here. Um, so in order for there to be a super bloom in Death Valley National Park, you really need these early rains followed by an El Nino pattern. So with evenly distributed moisture over time. Um, and if you get that, you'll get these amazing wildflower carpets, um, which are anchored uh, by all kinds of perennial shrubs, all sorts of cacti and beloved Joshua trees. Um, but yeah, it uh, it's, it's, can get quite hot and windy there, especially in the spring. And so if you don't even get spring uh, rain, uh, these plants can desiccate and the bloom can be really short-lived. So something that uh, you are, it would be impossible to miss here in a super bloom year is desert gold, Jurea canescens in the sunflower family. This is really the main plant that forms carpets in Death Valley. And um, it's usually what you see from the roads, especially at low elevations. Um, and I just love those big floppy ray flowers. I think they're so beautiful. So another more rare plant you'll see here, I have to show this because I have to let you all know that grasses have flowers too. Uh, a lot of people call them florets, but they count as wildflowers. Now this is a very special plant that grows in the Eureka Dunes at the north end of the park. Um, this is Swalenia and there are actually two other endemic plants that only grow on these dunes, um, but unfortunately this grass does seem to be declining, most likely due to climate change, um, but it is something that the park has, um, they're very interested in. They have a group of volunteers that monitors this every year, so there are many people concerned in looking out for this plant. And a few more photos of Death Valley's glory. All right, so now we're going west, a little bit southwest to the Antelope Valley Poppy Reserve. Now we're at the very western edge of the Mojave Desert. And you know, like its namesake, you can expect to see poppies here in an average and of course a super bloom year. Uh, it's, it's a really special place. And I actually recommend if you wanna see fields of poppies, going here over places like the freeway near near Elsinore, um, 
the folks who work here really have traffic control down. <laughs> you won't be disrupting anyone on the freeway who's trying to get home. Uh, and not only that, but they actually have a live wildflower cam. So even in 2021, you can check out the cam and see what the, the flowers are doing. Um, you know, additionally, you, you do have to pay to get in here, um, but uh, you can use your pass at many of the other state parks nearby, uh, Red Rock. Um, Canyon State Park is a great spot, and then nearby is Arthur D. Ripley uh, Desert Woodland State Park, which has some awesome Joshua tree specimens. All right, so like I said, you can definitely see poppies here, as you would expect. And does anyone see what else is in this picture? Yes, there are some invasive grasses there. Uh, I'd be interested to see how those do next time there is rain. And like I said, we're at the edge of the Mojave Desert, so there are Joshua trees nearby. And just a few more pictures of, of the reserve and its glory. All right. This is one of my favorites, Carrizo Plain National Monument. So this is the largest native grassland remaining in California. It's extremely biodiverse, um, not just in terms of plants, but also wildlife. Um, there's many federally uh, endangered and threatened species here. So flower-wise though, there is plenty to see. Uh, it has all of the, the uh, heavy hitters of super blooms, the purple owls clover, gold fields, hillside daisy, as well as many uncommon and rare plants. Uh, one of my favorites that I was able to see there a few years ago is the desert candle uh, in the mustard family, Colanthus inflatus. Um, there's a few species in, in Colanthus that, that do this inflated thing. And I think it's quite amazing that as an annual plant, it's able to put on, to grow that tall in just a short growing season. Um, which I imagine that that height gives it a strong advantage uh, over other wildflowers because the pollinators are, are able to get pretty easy access. Something else you might see here in a good wildflower year is the Kern Mallow. Um, this is federally listed as endangered. Uh, it's an annual plant. And so it's one you'll, you, you need enough rain in order to see this one come out. Um, but this one is really limited in distribution. It's mostly found just west of Bakersfield uh, at, at uh, Carrizo Plain, and then also a little bit in um, the Los Padres National Forest. And um, one thing I found out researching for this talk is that Aramalki, which is the name of the genus of this plant, actually means lonely mallow, which I really like. Uh, although it probably isn't very lonely in super bloom years. And just a few more pictures. This one's from Bob Wick. He takes some great photos for the Bureau of Land Management. This is of the, the lower elevations of Carrizo Plain. All right, and our last stop tonight is Table Mountain. Um, North Table Mountain Reserve. So this is at the northeastern edge of the Central Valley. Um, so you still get some of the same uh, super bloom type species that you'd see in Southern California, um, but they're all the way uh, north. This, this area is just uh, west of Chico. So yeah, this is at the edge of the Central Valley. And something unique about this area is it's the salt flow vernal pool. So um, Basically, this what you see here at the Table Mountain. It's a, an uplifted basalt sort of mesa. And there are certain areas that are impermeable to water. And so they collect winter rainfall. Um, there's also lots of fissures that form streams and waterfalls. So this area tends to be uh, a bit more watered because it's further north and it has these various ways of holding moisture. Um, so. One of the plants you'll see here is sky lupin. This is an anchor of super blooms everywhere. Uh, it's, it's quite common. You know, it's, it's grows in coastal environments um, and then the Sierra foothills, basically along the whole length of California. 
And something else you can see up here that you won't see here in Southern California, um, unless you know where to look at the Botana Garden, is the California pipe vine. Uh, this is Aristolochia californica, and I think it just has the most unusual and amazing looking flowers. Uh, supposedly, too, they're pollinated by fungus gnats, um, which I thought was interesting because there was some debate about what its pollinator was for a while. Um, but these do need a fair amount of water to survive, which is why uh, you, you have to go, part of why you have to go further north to find them. Um, all right. So a couple more pictures of Table Mountain. There's that sky lupin again. There's this oak. If you've been there, you probably know this oak. It's there right at the main entrance when you come in. All right, so it was great to see that, you know, go back in time a little bit and see some amazing wildflower spots. But what about years like this one? Um, where can we see wildflowers in drought years like we're having right now? You know, one thing to consider is geographic variability. Um, like someone else on the chat, they just mentioned that they had been up to Table Mountain. Well, if you look at this drought map, this is a little dated. It's from last month, um, but this shows that, uh, Oops, there we go. Sorry about that, guys. All right, um, so this shows uh, basically the status of drought in California, and especially in the Southeast, we're, we're in a severe, it, well, extreme to exceptional drought, um, but there are areas where it's not quite so bad, um, you know, especially the further north you go towards the coast. So that's something to consider. Um, Table Mountain did get a fair amount of rain, even though they're technically still in a drought. Um, so when you're thinking about where to go to look for flowers, uh, especially when we're we're not in a pandemic and you can travel a little further, you know, give that some consideration. Um, and geographic variability also, I think you can think of that in terms of um, elevation. So you could also think about going up higher uh, to mountains where there might be snowpack or areas that might have gotten more rainfall. And that sort of goes along with my next point, considering perennials versus annuals. You know, like I mentioned, a lot of the annuals might not be germinating in areas that didn't get rain, um, but there's a good chance perennials are gonna, you'll see at least some flowers and, and also higher up in elevation, they do, they do tend to be more rich in perennials. So you can think about um, more montane environments as being a good place to check out. You know, also think about places where water collects, right? Like uh, even in the deserts, uh, I can tell you from personal experience this year, there are places in the deserts where there are some pretty good blooms. Um, so think canyons, washes, even roadsides. So the water tends to collect on the side of the road and you can see some good blooms there. Um, also anywhere where there's naturally flowing water, streams, lakes, uh, meadows. And then of course there's any place that's artificially watered like a, like a garden. So just some pictures, here's a, you know, kind of what I'm talking about, uh, you know, I'm working on a floor for my research right now, and it's a pretty difficult time to go out and try and collect flowers. So in the desert, I'm really targeting places like this that uh, have narrow sides that are going to, would have funneled the water. There's a great shot of a roadside in Anza Borrego. There are some native species blooming there on the side. The uh, Lower Montane Meadow in the Southern Sierra Nevada. And then an Alpine Meadow. Uh, I think this photo was taken in July or August. There's still snow there. So places like this uh, are, are gonna get more, more water. And then the Matilla Hop Poppy here at the garden. I had to throw that in there. <laughs> I mean, isn't that a super bloom? That looks like a super bloom to me. <laughs> All right, so, you know, 
I gave you some ideas and I just really encourage you to think creatively. I think in years like this, uh, it's almost like a treasure hunt. You know, the flowers aren't gonna just totally reveal themselves. You have to work a little bit for it. Um, you know, if you're just starting out, I recommend this book called Wildflowers of California, a month by month guide. And it tells you where you can go all throughout the year in California to see blooms. And there are definitely some places in here that are more off the beaten path. Um, so books are a great resource. Also just calling visitor centers. I've gotten a lot of great help just by, you know, calling folks on the phone. They're used to getting a lot of questions like this and they tend to have some great advice as to where you can go to see flowers. Um, also online, especially there's two really good Facebook groups, uh, California Native Plant Society, of course, and then also the California Wildflower Tip Line. Um, lots of folks kindly share their, their uh, wildflower destinations and you can get pretty real time information on what's happening in California. Um, I'll also mention that it has some great resources so you can just get loads of information on great hikes to go on. Maria, do you mind repeating that? It kind of cut out for a second. Yeah. Um, uh, back up to online resources. Uh, just after you mentioned the wildflower tip line. Oh, yeah. yeah. So the Modern Hiker website, um, this is the same person that, that was promoting the no wildflowers were harmed uh, hashtag. Um, they have a great website uh, that lists many, many resources on places you can go to hike and, and find wildflowers. Um, so I really recommend that page. And then one of my favorites is uh, the longstanding Theodore Payne Foundation Wildflower Hotline. This gets updated weekly. You can call it and listen to a very famous person read to you where to go to see the wildflowers. That's pretty awesome. I think it would be fun to just go wherever that person told you to go and make a game out of it. Um, so I hope that gives you some ideas of, of how you can um, find some wildflower destinations in years like this. You know, it's great that we can visit these places, but you know, if you're like me, you might be wondering about how the plants are faring. You know, are they doing okay <laughs> in these conditions this year? You know, what happens to these super bloom type plants in, in dry years? You know, and hopefully uh, you've put it together and based on what we've talked about with dormancy, I can assure you that many species are, are doing okay. They're just resting underneath the soil, waiting for the right conditions to arise. Um, you know, and the other good news is that drought years like this thin out invasive species. You know, there's definitely places where hooray, the cheatgrass or the red roam didn't come up. And so it's not putting more seeds into the seed bank. So that's a win. No, but it is possible that if these drought conditions continue year after year after year, that we could start to see the seed bank starting to deplete. Additionally, um, if drought continues, we could see uh, massive soil erosion, which could impact future super blooms. Now, and that's just the drought. Uh, there's more change coming along with climate change. Uh, as you all know, the air temperature is predicted to increase, um, which will have dramatic impacts. But one thing I wasn't aware of is that in desert environments, especially where there's no canopy, the soil actually gets quite a bit hotter than the air temperature does. And at least one study, if not two, I think, have shown that um, these in increased soil temperatures over the summer can actually break dormancy of the seeds. So they lose their dormancy mechanism because of these high temperatures. You know, and now that's not every single species, but it can definitely happen with some. You know, we could also see unseasonal heat waves. So warming temperatures maybe coming in the winter and tricking plants into germinating when it's not really the right time. You know, and we might also see increased seedling mortality. So if the distribution of precipitation is really changing, we could see plants emerging and then not getting the sustaining water that they need. Um, something I just read about recently is from a researcher named Chelsea Arnold, who's been studying meadows in the Sierra and how 
Um, in years like now, you might have heard that uh, the snowpack is melting at an alarming rate, faster than researchers have really seen. And meadows really depend on snow melt. And if they don't get that over time, they can actually dry out. And once they fully dry out, they lose their sponge-like quality and they can't get it back. Um, so that's another potential uh, risk that could come from climate change. And as we saw last year, a change in fire frequency. And so this could definitely have dramatic impacts on the seed bank. Uh, this could also occur if fire happens in places where plants aren't fire adapted. Um, you know, we don't know exactly how seeds might, might behave to a really high temperature fire coming through. All right, so um, you all might have remembered or had seen that when we were first uh, getting ready for this talk, we saw some audience questions ahead of time and we had two people write in and they are also were asking about drought and climate change. So I wanted to bring up these questions now and they're sort of related to each other, but uh, so I'm just gonna add, uh, read aloud the first part of this question. This is from Twitter user Feline Cannonball who writes, not directly about plants, but how do pollinators, plant bugs, et cetera, weather multi-year bust periods? Um, this was pretty much my favorite part of researching this talk was trying to answer this question. Uh, you know, short answer, it's really complicated. The first thing I learned is that worldwide, we're already dealing with severely altered baselines when it comes to, to our insects. Terrestrial insects have declined 50% over the last 75 years, which is a huge amount. So we're already starting with a low amount. And then I also found that drought years have different effects um, depending on what latitude you're at, what elevation you're at, the land use type, et cetera. But to make it easy on myself, I'm gonna narrow this down to, let's just talk about super bloom spots in the desert. So what happens to all the pollinators in super bloom areas? Well, it turns out that um, many pollinators here, uh, let's take bees for instance, they actually uh, specialize on annual plants and they tend to follow the same cues as these annual plants. What do I mean by that? Well, a lot of these bees actually stay dormant uh, in the same way a seed does. They can stay dormant uh, between one year, maybe even up to 10 years. And um, researchers have found that some of these bees, they emerge, they follow the same cues that their host plant does. So um, I thought that was really, really cool. Um, so these specialist bees might be okay during the bust years, but there are more generalist pollinators that do come up every year. And those ones I suspect uh, will be more hard hit. And then uh, Feline Cannibal asks that the second part of her question, so now we're back to the super bloom cycles, does it take pollinators some time to catch up with the super bloom after many bust years? If so, does that impact pollination and seed production? And this is really similar to what another um, person wrote in, Eric Lopresti sends in this question. When there are that many flowers, orders of magnitude more than usual years, are there enough pollinators to ensure reproduction for all of them? Or is a normal year better for an individual plant's pollination success? And that's a great question. You know, again, this is a picture of a euphorb mini fairy bee. This is something that specializes on these euphorbs. So I think for, for individual species that are very connected to their pollinator, I suspect that these will do all right. But, um, you know, it's possible that that plants that rely on more generalists might have a harder time. This is just sort of speculation. But one thing that we do know from many studies is that these bloom and bust cycles gradually impact the composition of plants that come out. And, you know, uh, that way one isn't dominating the whole scene. So um, that's my short answer. It's pretty complicated and really uh, it varies from species to species. All right, but that also got me thinking, those pollinator questions got me thinking, what about all the other creatures in the food web? Um, so I came across this study that was published in 2018 
And this looked at Carrizo Plain during the extreme drought years of 2012 to 2015. And these researchers studied 423 different species to see how drought impacted them. And what they found was that in that time period, the plant die off got worse every single year. Um, after three years, the giant kangaroo rats, which are seed eaters, they suffered massive decline after three years. And overall, carnivores were the hardest hit. So the top of the food chain wasn't doing so well. Um, but their surprising result was that uh, there was a small number of species, about 4%, um, for which they actually did better. And that's because the more dominant species were pushed back. Uh, so there's this what's called competitive release. And so in some ways, the drought was good news for, for the little guys. So, uh, you know, if you're like me, you, you might want to help. <laughs> climate change is, is um, climate change and drought, uh, you know, it's bad news for, for some of our pollinators, certainly wildlife. And one thing that you can do uh, if you have the resources is to grow native plants at home or at your place of work uh, to support local wildlife, you know, especially if you think about all of the native uh, wildlife habitat that's been just that's been lost. Um, something like a, a home garden that's uh, watered on occasion can help fill in a gap for some of these pollinators and, and small animal species. You know, that's not going to do it alone, though. We also need big solutions. And so supporting responsible green energy and climate change legislation is important. I say responsible green energy because um, industrial scale solar can actually have impacts on super blooms. Uh, a lot of solar, well, pretty much most solar, the way these large solar projects work is they have to basically blade the ground down and scrape the seed bank. And it's not an environment where, where super blooms can occur anymore. And um, finally, one other effort that's being done here at California Bot Botanic Garden in collaboration with many other organizations is seed banking. So, um, you know, we don't know how climate change is going to impact the seed bank, but one thing we can do is collect a small amount, a sustainable amount of seeds and bank it in a more controlled environment um, so that should the worst happen, we have a safety net um, to keep these plants from going extinct. So uh, there is an effort underway right now to seed bank 75% uh, of California's rarest plant species. And what's interesting about this is not only are we saving seeds, but we're finding out a lot more about the, their dormancy mechanisms, their viability. So here's a picture of our staff member, Anthony Perez, applying a burn treatment um, to, to break the dormancy. And here's a photo of a germination trial to um, see what the germination rates are, and uh, over time we'll have a sense of what the viability may be for, for these species. You know, and I'll add this at the very end, um, you know, there are a lot of California's wild gardens are under threat by things like housing, wind energy, gold mining, um, in Nevada, solar energy projects. So, you know, just thinking about um, wild places and how we need them intact in order for super blooms to happen. And I bring that up because there is an amazing article just published today in Vogue magazine by Miles Griffiths that features three, three of us here at California Botanic Garden um, talking about wildflowers. I encourage you to check out that article and uh, hear, hear the take of the author and, and perhaps supplement what you learned tonight. All right, so I'd like to thank all the photographers who provided their, their work and flower followers who um, share their, their data, their wildflower tips. Um, so thank you for providing these under, under uh, fair use. Uh, and with that, I'll finish up and open it up for questions. Great, Maria, thank you so much. Um, that was really wonderful to go on that tour with you and you know, hear a little bit about what we can do um, at, you know, at, at an individual level. 
Um, but so yeah, if you have any questions for Maria, feel free to go ahead and type them in either the chat or the Q&A and we can address some of the questions that you may have. Let's see, I see someone wrote, um, maybe I just missed, but what are examples of common invasive plants affecting wildflower blooms, super blooms in the Claremont area, California, et cetera? Um, you know, definitely invasive mustards. And, um, you know, I, I'm actually pretty new to the Claremont area, but I can speak for um, red brome is a big one a bit further east. I see Kristen nodding, so maybe that is a problem here. Um, that one's a really big problem, but fortunately that one has, its seeds are viable on average about 18 months. So that's one that drought can wipe out pretty quickly. All right, so um, one of the members is asking, so rain is forecasted for the coastal areas of SoCal this coming Monday. How much rain would be needed to stimulate more blooms or is it too late for typical spring blooms this year? You know, I'll be honest and say, I don't know much about the coastal areas. I'm a, I'm a desert botanist. So perhaps someone in the audience might actually know the coastal environments a little bit well, better. But um, I can say that in, you know, in, in the deserts, it, it would definitely be too late. Uh, it, it'll prolong the blooms that are already there, but you won't see germination of, of anything new, typically with spring rain. Right. Um, and so uh, do you, can you touch on what specifically your master's thesis is on and a little bit about your research? Sure. Yeah, so I am, um, oh, real quick, Lucinda just confirmed that. <laughs> All right. I, that means I must have paid attention in class. <laughs> um, so I am, um, uh, as far as my research goes, I'm, I'm completing a floristic study. So it's really a systematic survey of all of the plant species that occur in, a, occur in a given area. So my particular area is in the Southern Inyo Mountains, uh, which is right in between Death Valley National Park and the Eastern Sierra. If you're interested in hearing a little bit more about Maria's uh, study site, she did a talk last November um, about her site and um, that's available on the digital content page of the website as well. So you can go back and find that talk. Um, so we have a question. So uh, one of our audience members, their daughter's school would like to plant some native plants to help with butterflies. Um, what natives would be good for that? Not exactly wildflowers, but related. It's definitely related, yeah. <laughs> totally. Um, milkweeds are a great, great plant for butterflies. Just make sure that you're planting native milkweeds uh, because typically what you might find at more mainstream stores, they aren't the native ones and they um, might actually be doing some harm to other pollinators. Um, and, you know, it's, it's interesting though, there's, there are some researchers, I don't know if you all remember the painted ladies that came out in, in droves in 2019, but there's someone at UCR, I saw that's researching them and they saw that those butterflies landed on something like 93 different species of plants. So it, it can vary, uh, but I suggest milkweeds because they're so important for monarch butterflies. Right. Um, and so do you know, is there a, a, a best time for rain to fall to stimulate a super bloom? Um, you know, for desert super blooms, it's going to be um, in, in the early fall. So it's going to be, um, I'm going to stop looking at the chat because they keep getting distracted. <laughs> but for desert super blooms, it's going to be early on. But I would say, you know, the best is really when it's uh, 
kind of throughout the whole time. You can't go wrong with a whole lot of rain from early fall through the winter. <laughs> right. Um, so, um, this is just kind of, I think, more of a, a, a top, you know, comment on some, you know, they're asking that one problem in the area is having to hire people to do brush clearance. And so that they may not be familiar with some native plants. So that all the plants are destroyed in that case. And some of those may be dormant, um, like monkey flowers that might look dead to some people. And so do you, uh, um, yeah, I guess just kind of touching on that, if there's a way to get the word out there to help with um, with with maintenance workers not destroying yeah. some, some of these dormant plants. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, you know, it definitely is is uh, some education needs to happen, and I think unfortunately in some places they are doing the most cost effective or the thing that seems the most cost effective it might not actually be in the long run but is just to you know cut everything down quickly um you know one thing i've thought about is like someone has suggested that it might be cool to actually come up with a plant guide of of senest plants because you can actually tell a lot by you know i've been doing this in my study site because i this is my study site and it doesn't look like that this year and so what i've been doing is trying to id like oh what was this thing did i actually id it correctly did i get it last year and so um you know that that's one possibility um but you know that might be depending on who's doing the clearing it might be either you know, folks uh, uh, with the city or, you know, pe people may be holding them accountable. That might be one way you could see change. Right. But that's a good point. And um, what is your favorite wildflower? My favorite wildflower? They're all my favorite. <laughs> um, you know, my favorite actually right now, it's this little teeny tiny plant called the badger flat thread plant. Its flower is the size of a head of a pencil. It's about two millimeters. And this is one that bloomed in profusion in 2019. Um, and it actually is new to science because perhaps because it's so small, perhaps because it needs a ton of rain to bloom. And it pretty much only grows in hard to access places in the desert. So I like this one because it's uh, sort of new on the scene and, and hard to find. Um, but that's the badger flat thread plant. Mm, very cool. <laughs> yeah, so um, they're, they're asking if, if California Botanic Garden could facilitate a resource list of personnel that can preserve hillside plants and provide irrigation maintenance for residents to support. So that's a good question. That's not something I, I don't know, Maria may not have an answer for and I don't, but that's something to, to think about and look into for sure. Um, so thank you for that question. That's something we can we can think about. <laughs> um, all right. Well, do if we have any other questions. Um, so, you know, some other plants that people were mentioning for butterflies, definitely buckwheats. Um, uh, Yeah, aster is yarrow gum plant. Um, so there's different places that you can source some of these butterfly plants to. You know, California Botanic Garden has the Grow Native Nursery, which I believe they will have milkweed soon, um, but they definitely have other plants that support butterfly habitat. But then also Theodore Payne, I know that they actually do have milkweed, native milkweed seeds right now. So if you're in the, if you're looking for something to plant, you can look at those two resources. Um, and, and the Xerces project, yeah, they have a list of butterfly plants as well, which somebody put into the chat. So you can check out that as well. All right, so if there are any other questions before we head out, well, while we wait for maybe a couple more questions, I just wanna say thank you to Maria. This was really wonderful. Um, you know, I, it was nice to go on a virtual tour of these sites 
in their super bloom years and now and kind of give us some some hits or hints and and tips on how to view wildflowers in a year that may be not quite a super bloom year. Um, so this was really wonderful. Thank you, Maria. Thank and you. Thank, yeah, thank you everyone for attending and joining us tonight. Um, we hope that you feel inspired to do some wildflower viewing and to kind of take part in, in the solution to, to, um, to wildflower loss if you can. All right. Well, thank you again, Maria. And thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thanks, everyone, for coming.